be called to order, and I want to welcome everybody to our meeting of Health, Education, Entertainment, Neighborhoods, Parks, Arts, and Rivers Committee. Uh, it's a little past after one, and we are in City Hall, room 1060, and this meeting is called to order. I'd like to remind everybody in the audience who would like to speak today on any one of the items or during general public comment to please fill out a com I mean, actually, fill out the kiosk uh, comment um, form at the kiosk. And um, I'd also like to make a note that our special meeting of this committee that was scheduled for 115 will be canceled. Uh, but now at this point, uh, we're going to take um, those who sign up for multiple public uh, comment items as well as general public comment together. And I'm going to call up Cor <coughs> Corey Schmidt, Arnold Sachs, and Antonio Ramirez. You guys could come on up, and you guys will get three minutes, two minutes for your items and one minute for public comment. Whoever comes up first could speak. Corey Schmidt. Arnold Sachs, Antonia Ramirez. How are you, Antonia? I'm fine, thank you. So three minutes? Yeah, thank <clears> you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's start with public comments. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, um, <clears throat> um, Councilman Rue, there is no public safety. You keep talking about public safety in Los Angeles. There is no public safety. Los <coughs> Angeles is uninhabitable. It is... It is dangerous, it is truly unsafe, and it's a stink bomb. Let's be truthful. I live on the streets, I see it all firsthand. Nothing gets by me, really. Having said that, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, in my public comments, I missed public comments, I, I, I missed uh, counsel this morning because I was calling the police for help because of gang, the gangbangers that are employed at the La Placita. And I'll discuss that later. Um, but I was so happy and so elated to see the Navy um, coming over to La Placita to play uh, saxophone and music. What, what are, it, was, it was wonderful to see these military young studs playing music for all of us for free. It was, it's LA Labor Weekend and they're, uh, they're entertaining. They did it out of the love of their heart free, and many of us that were there were just thrilled to watch these Navy young sailors play free for, for all the people. They were happy, they were animated, they were jovial, and they did it with love and passion. You don't see that anymore. They took pride in what they did. Having said that, thank you very much. It was just, we, uh, La Placita is dead. It's ugly, it's filthy, it's dirty. Speak to the items. Thank I'm you here. very much. Um, and so God bless the United States military and God bless Donald Trump. Um, having said that, um, let me go over to the neighborhood, um, neighborhood empowerment. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do something about the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods, one by one, are falling down like dominoes. Um, they are unsafe. They are unclean. They are gang infested. They are drug infested, opiate infested, and it's just, they're just dangerous. Every neighborhood all across, even Beverly Hills, has gotten to be a cesspool. They're ugly. No more. There are no good neighborhoods in L.A. city or county. They're ugly, they're filthy, and they're dirty, and they are gang and drug and all the uh, infested. So let's start doing something about the neighborhoods. Help the people. Help the law-abiding citizens, man. And, um, and my goodness... Ladies and gentlemen, um, we must protect the children. Education is important. Let's, when we educate, let's be truthful. Tell the people the truth. The neighborhoods are unsafe. LA is unsafe. It's, it's, it stinks. Let's tell the tourists and all the travelers that LA is dangerous. Don't tell them it's safe. It is not. It's ugly and it's unsafe and it's dirty and they're going to get contaminated or infected with diseases and bacteria and God knows what else. So having said that, be truthful, man. If you can't tell the truth, then don't open your mouth. I'm here. I make no money. You make more money than I do. I don't make a penny, but I tell you the truth because I live out there. I want people to be safe. I want people to be healed. I want them to be whole, and I want them to walk out with their pocketbooks. That's what I want. Again, it's not about the money. It's about principle. Thank you. God Thank bless you. America. Donald Trump. Thank Trump. you. Could I get Corey Schmidt and Arnold Sachs, please? Arnold, can we split it up two minutes first for the items, and then we'll do one minute for public comment? Okay, so if you could speak on the items first. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, Arnold Sachs. Um, so I just spoke, uh, I just signed up for item number six, uh, referring to the California State Preschool and California Preschools <coughs> in general. Uh, you might have heard, uh, read stories in the newspaper when they talked about the uh, Measure E for the schools that uh, students are getting $25,000 a year from uh, LAUSD. 
So that's uh, twenty-five thousand dollars a year, but it's actually for the students one hundred and eighty days. So it's actually fifty thousand dollars for the full year if you do that math. Um, pretty much, if you do, you cut that in half and you say twelve thousand five hundred times thirty, which is the number of people in a home room, would be um, oh I don't know, pretty much a lot of money every class time it meets. Have you ever done anything about looking into that and why we're getting so much money? for the students, and yet you have to grade on a curve, and, and uh, there's no facilities worthwhile. Could you hold this time right now? I'm sorry, did, did he sign up for just item six or other items too? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. And so so um, we need to have some people look into the fact that so much money is going into the students, teachers end up having to buy products out of their pocket. <clears throat> uh, I also signed up for, uh, what else did I sign up for here? Uh, the, I don't even remember, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the uh, Senior Community Service Employment Program for fiscal year 2019-20. So are you employing seniors? Or are you, is this helping to f feed the senior community? I remember that was a big part of a budget item, that feeding the seniors. And uh, do we have anything involving any kind of marijuana uh, funding, uh, the sales tax, or even the excise tax going into any of these programs that you're planning in this um, committee. We never hear anything about that at all from anybody. Um, so I'm going to just kind of like see and start my public comment. Um, I was actually thinking about, uh, well, I actually went to uh, Board of Public Works and they had an interesting item on the 6th Street Viaduct. You know, they're building the bridge. Nobody got in touch with Union Pacific Railroads to get authorization to use the rail lines or to figure out how to schedule the train so that the companies that are actually doing the building, because they said they have a real problem, could actually work in the area that they need to work in because the railroad won't let them. So how do you approve a project back in 2010 or 2012? Because I heard something about um, environmental engineering being there since 2013 and not get authority <coughs> from the Union Pacific Railroads to use their railroad tracks. Uh, as far as neighborhoods, you know, Jan Perry, when she was a councilwoman, she passed an ordinance that restricted fast food restaurants in South Central L.A. Nowhere else in the city. You think with Planning and Land Use Department or Plant Plum, they would turn that around. I know there's only one McDonald's. You think somebody would say, we need jobs, especially with a $15 an an hour Thank minimum you. wage coming Sachs. up. Don't you think that's a good idea? Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Um, Corey Schmidt. This is the last call for Corey Schmidt. No. Okay, the, that's the last call for Corey Schmidt, and that closes pu general public comment. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, why don't you come on up? Did you sign up for an item or a public general public comment? Okay, come on up. A minute for general public comment. Uh, did you sign up for other items as well? Did you sign up for other items as well? Uh, well, it's the uh, neighborhood council thing I wanted to do. The whole okay. Time on that. <clears throat> so you signed up for one item or two items or which items? I did Three. general and and uh, item one. You want to speak at it, both of them right now? So we'll give you two minutes. Okay. Okay. I hope I have enough time. Yeah, we'll get two minutes and uh, yeah. Okay. Can you state your name for the record. Uh, Gary Fordyce, North Hills West Neighborhood Council. Uh, sadly, it is in my opinion the neighborhood council elections were fraught with gross malfeasance, allowing bylaw violations and election rule violations. Christopher Garcia stated at Bonk he does not vet candidates and simply takes candidates' word regarding documentation. Uh, we have 13 candidates. Uh, at least five of them uh, were. Uh, failed to submit proper documentation. Uh, they were allowed to submit documentation uh, slightly a week beyond the extended deadline. Uh, there was electioneering. Oh, I should drop back. Uh, Shirley Dabbitt, who uh, filed as a candidate uh, for a church that isn't going to open until September 15. That's still ahead of us. It didn't, church doesn't exist. She has since resigned after two meetings because I called her on it publicly. Uh, 
Christopher Garcia denied that, saying that it's your fault because you didn't submit. But I was also denied a PRA request uh, because subjectively, because it had private information. I received information later. There was one line redacted. Uh, it was unnecessary. Uh, there was electioneering. Uh, board members were escorting um, uh, candidates up to the registration table, uh, and the uh, city clerk wouldn't uh, acknowledge that that was being done. Um, there was obstructionism by a, a candidate who uh, had a slate uh, that people were claiming uh, they thought it was uh, a board slate, and they were very confused with it. And a board member was handing it out, uh, forcing it on people and not allowing them to pass until they accepted the slate. Um, as I said, PRAs were not accepted and denied subjectively. Thank you, okay. Gary. Thank you. And you know, we are going to have that presentation, so hopefully a lot of those questions will be answered. But thank you, Gary. And we could okay, talk about that. Later. I have yeah. evidence on all of you this. You could submit that to us as well. Um, could I get Herman uh, sign up for, <coughs> we made it just in time for public comment, so sign up for multiple items, so three minutes, two, can we do two minutes for items first and one minute for general? Sure. Okay. Clock. Do I start the clock? Why don't I got my glasses on? State your name for the record, please. Oh, back to Zarian, zero nine five oh five twenty nine. Fuck the niggers. So, as you heard regarding the health education there's neighborhood. Oh, hold on for a second. Hold on. For the, I think there's some fucking? disturbance from the. Oh, okay. Oh, no, okay. All right, why, go ahead. Why are you fucking retaliating against me? Are you afraid that I don't know what the fuck I'm saying? Don't disrupt me during my public comment card. That's a violation of the fucking Brown Act just because I'm retarded. You can stick to the items, please. Yeah. I'll take the fucking street back. Recording neighborhood after action report. Fuck your empowerment. I'm done. Then on item two, communication of the mayor. Fuck the mayor. Regarding Obama, fuck the nigger. He will have a 50 caliber in his head soon. Post it. Shoot the nigger's country. Fuck for another four years. Just like Obama did us for eight. Then on item number three, city attorney. Oh, watch out. They might bring the threat management unit. <laughs> then on CD5, Mr. Rue, the tavern, is that where you went that night you had that incident? Oh, never mind, off topic. Let me get back on topic. Regarding off beverages, never drink and sleep with women that are unconscious. Bad decisions. Then on number five, the Palisades Park Improvement Corporation for Park, well, the first amendment of the United States, according to Bagdazarian versus number 0950529-2011, is similar to US 395-444-1969, as they would say, Clarence Brandenburg, send those fucking white Jew Orioles back to Israel. Let's save America from this fucking to the food top, and beverage concession at Rancho Park. Shoot the niggers in the Gulf Ports if I could. If I can't, I wouldn't. Thank okay, you. one minute general public comment. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard regarding my briefcase regarding number 735290 for the record, we'll take the fucking street again or later. Regarding my constitutional First Amendment under the United States of Bagdazarian, or Whitney versus California, or Watts versus the United States, why does this fucking retaliatory city of Los Angeles continue to harass me, intimidate uh, me? You still have to stick to the topic. I am on committee. topic. It's regarding yeah. how the city clerk, the city attorney, has done anything right on item number three, on updates, and I'm updating you regarding my briefcases that you continue to threaten Mm, me by anti-slap. So I'll have something to slap to you. 
objective and subjective standard. Test yourself, asshole. Thank you, Sherman. Um, and for those in the audience who might be here for the first time, um, City Council and I personally apologize for what you have heard and witnessed. Uh, this is this is First Amendment rights uh, in action, and we do have to uphold uh, by our U.S. Constitution, and we do give everybody equal time. Um, and that is why when we give everybody a minute per item, we unfortunately have to give everyone like Gary, who had a lot of items who wanted who he wanted to speak on. Uh, equal time with um, with what you just heard today. Um, you, don't be shocked, you might hear a little bit more of it, but this will be the last public comment. Uh, Wayne, two minutes for your items. Yes, that's right. So, ah, so let's see here. This recording is, and just in case something happens, I'm, I'm got the app for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, so it'll be online. Now we got ourselves. Verbal niggers for city clerk and department of neighbor after action election. I want pre-nigger election reports, not post-nigger election reports. I know I voted. I voted yes for the Skid Row neighborhood canceled. I still don't have my neighborhood canceled. Now we get this fucking cunt, Rackwell Beltran, to take over for the felonious cunt that laughed. Yes. Now, what are you going to do about Skid Row and C-Bid and the FBI? Well, let me tell you here, and that's why I put up my fucking phone. Now, what you did is that you pissed these people off here in the phone because what you did did was is you did not let it separate so Mr. Weezer could run him through d -Link. The items, please. Yeah, yeah you done. and you, yeah, just keep fucking interrupting. See, people here in the city family don't like to listen to things, so they just want to do things like number six and piss all over state preschool. What you gonna teach kids? Let's see. Let's ask little Myron. Myron, are you there? Yeah, Daddy. That's right. Don't call me Daddy. Why? Six items on the well, then, uh, hold on. In a minute. You want preschool kids? Remember, ladies, don't put Daddy on the birth certificate so you get your proper welfare. That's called matter of current price. Yes, that's right. Don't put those kids down on the birth certificate because you know he's got four or five out there. So one minute public comment. General comment. Why did D-Link spend all that money hiring Rocky Del Gadillo? What did Rocky Del Gadillo do to overturn an election? Well, Gracie Lou ain't talking. She's hiding in another job. So you're going to put Rockwell Beltran, the cover-up artist, like Eileen Decker, the police commission, the cover-up artist. The artist is a cover-up. That's right. Cover-up, cover-up, cover-up. And I remember a certain nigger in the room said, I believe that Mr. Spindler should be made an example out of. Yeah, that's right. Good items. Yes, that's right. He was Against made. Committee. Yes, well, Mrs. Spindler is a nigger. Mr. Spindler's a piece of shit. Fuck Wade Spindler. And fuck you all. He's an asshole. I don't trust him either. Thank you, Herman. Thank you, and that closes general public comment and multiple public items. Um, and I pr and I apologize again for individuals who had to experience that um, in your day today. Uh, we unfortunately experienced that every single day in the city council, as pretty much every single council committee. We were very very close in um, in closing public comment before um, certain individuals who like to hop around from committee to committee, committee to committee, um, to just say anything. Um, so I, again, I apologize to the audience who might be hearing that for the first time. Um, but this is why it makes our country so beautiful, because we do have the freedom of speech. We do not have to agree with what is said, uh, but we do allow in this country for it to be said. So thank you so very much. Um, with that said, uh, that satisfies uh, multiple public Multiple item and general public comment and colleagues, if there are no objections, I would like to take items five, six, and seven on consent. Thank you. Uh, and so that will be the order. 
And uh, colleagues, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with item number two today on the agenda. So, uh, Daryl, can you read in item number two, please? Sure. Communication from the mayor <clears throat> relative to the appointment of a Ms. Raquel Beltran as permanent general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Thank you. And do we have any more public comment on this card? No public comment. Great. And I know Ms. Beltran is here in the audience. Uh, want, do you want to come on up? And Raquel, thank you so very much for being here. And again, congratulations on your appointment to be the next general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. So thank you for being here. And, um, and uh, I just want to just kick off this discussion. Um, and if you could tell us, the audience, and everyone who's hearing today um, online, tell us a bit, little bit of, about yourself and why you're interested in serving as a general manager of Dunn. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you, Council Member Ryu, Honorable Members of the Committee. It is with great pleasure that I present myself to you this afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity that has been provided to me to be considered for service as the City of Los Angeles' General Manager for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. The Department's stated mission is to promote civic engagement, to make government more responsive to local needs through a citywide system of neighborhood councils. I'm looking forward to the opportunity, if confirmed, to partner with this committee, the mayor, the city council, the city clerk and city attorney who work closely with the department and all other city departments to further the department's stated mission. Most importantly, I look forward to serving and supporting the members of the neighborhood councils. I bring to the city of Los Angeles my combined experience in civic engagement, public administration, which includes experience developing well-structured governance bodies at a local level and community organizing. Specific to this position, I've had the opportunity to work in partnership with neighborhood council leaders for over 10 years in several different roles, including at the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles and at the Pat Brown Institute. It was while serving as the executive director for the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles that I was introduced to this amazing dual democracy system of neighborhood councils. It was in this space that I was able to interact with communities throughout Los Angeles on a broad range of issues, including management of community-based elections, such as the resident advisory councils for the housing authority for the city of Los Angeles. The league also partnered with neighborhood councils to administer unbiased candidate debates, including a 2013 forum for Council District 13 at Carapeshian Hall. My work at the Pat Brown Institute for Public Affairs at Cal State LA supporting the universe, Civic University for Neighborhood Councils served to, among many things, allow me to guide neighborhood council leaders on the use of effective local government adv advocacy techniques and considerations. Serving the neighborhood councils in this immensely challenging role is an opportunity of a lifetime. My deep interest in this position is motivated by a lifelong commitment to serving the communities in which I live and work. As my children said to me when I shared this journey with them, you mean you might get hired to do what you really do for fun? It is said that you can tell a lot about a workplace by the recruitment and selection process for hiring its employees. My participation in this recruitment process provided me with an opportunity to engage with city departments, community leaders, Chair Ryu, and Mayor Garcetti. Each stage in the process deepened my commitment and interest in the general manager position because it was clear that there was a shared interest in serving the communities of Los Angeles and in supporting and strengthening the neighborhood council system. The process to be considered for this position has allowed me to learn more about future expectations of the department. They are varied, numerous, and understandably complex. My approach will be to continue the efforts currently underway in a manner that is seem as seamless as possible. I'll be inclined to examine the extent to which work can be administered through greater efficiency and improved and expanded internal and external partnerships. I applaud the work of this committee, the city attorney, the city clerk, and the neighborhood councils in developing and discussing reforms in the areas of uniformity, transparency, and inclusiveness into the neighborhood council system. The recommendations for implementation of neighborhood council reforms to be presented to you today are robust. Exploring these reforms will indeed be one of my most important goals. 
I look forward to working with you to define and advance the future of the department. I'm committed to doing my very best, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and that answers all my questions that I had for you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I do want to highlight your experience um, with the Pat Brown Institute, which we have Rafe Sonnenshine in the back over there, which is my advisor as well, um, and all the work that you did there. And actually, I think we all probably spoke at the Civic U. Um, and I'm um, and very excited with all the overlap that you already did there. And of course, your work at the League of Women Voters, uh, without a doubt, um, will come in very handy. Um, and I am very much looking forward to your, um, your one-year goals and, um, and, and implementation of all the various things, because you're, you're going to uh, start, start the ground running, because there's so much things that we're going to uh, put on your table. But I have no doubt you will be able to um, tackle it head on, especially with the great team that you have at Dunn. Um, and, and, and by the way, you know, your, your predecessor is going to go be at personnel. So if you have any hiring issues, you know you have an, <laughs> you know you have an ally over there <laughs> to help speed that through. But I'm um, very much looking forward to working with you. We're very excited at this. And uh, I want to open up to my colleagues. If you have any questions. Well, I, too, want to uh, just welcome you again. Uh, Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your willingness to, uh, to serve. And I think your background in community organizing and civic engagement is a unique kind of combo. Uh, something that, something that uh, Dunn can, can take great advantage of in our communities. But talk a little bit about uh, how we can make the, the, the process even more, um, more responsive, more reflective, more engaging. You know, some communities still aren't really uh, taking advantage of this, of this council, of this resource in ways they should. What are your thoughts for what we can do differently, what we can build on, how we can make it better? Uh, my guess is that, and, and based on the experience I've had with the neighborhood councils with which I've interacted, is that it, it varies by council. Each council is functioning um, somewhat differently. So I think in some cases their needs might be different in terms of the outreach techniques or the discussions that might need to be had with communities in order to develop their interest in the neighborhood councils that are serving them, such that they can have confidence in their own abilities to serve on the neighborhood councils and to bring others. No, well, I agree. One, one size doesn't fit all. My question is, how, what are you going to do? What are you proposing we do to sort of tap into that? Are we going to be uh, interviewing all the neighborhood councils? Are you going to be going around talking to them all? Is there going to be some opportunity to bring folks together? How do you kind of see that gap being bridged? My interest is to, st is to start with listening tours, to attend meetings with all the neighborhood councils and the alliances, have a short informal survey of questions that I'll be asking them, um, reporting that back with, my, with the staff, and to begin to develop assessments for each council about how we might want to proceed from that point on. But, but my interest is to try to get out there and meet with everybody as soon as possible. I think I'd want them to know who I am, let them know that I'm approachable, mm -hmm. and, um, and that I'm interested in what they have to say and what they have to share. Um, my, my only concern is there are 99 of them, and I want to get to them as soon as possible. If time was no op was no there were no limitations in time, I do them all in the first month. So I'm very committed to going out and talking to them and on, on a, in a listening tour. Well, we, we, we share your commitment to wanting to hear what they say. And when you report, when you get reports back to your staff, I hope you'll also include the committee. Of course. Uh, as a part of that review process, because I'm sure we also want to uh, have a better understanding, better feel for what's, what's there, what's possible. All right, thank you. Happy to do so. Thank you, and congratulations for this designation. And did we meet at that debate back in the spring of 2013? Was Val Zavala, was she the yes, moderator? Was. Okay. Yes, that was, a, that was an exciting one. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes. And I liked the end result. <laughs> uh, but thank you for your, uh, your service to this. Now, one, one perspective that I bring into this, this whole neighborhood council system, and, and, and that is our entire volunteer corps in the city of Los Angeles, um, I have seen many triumphs, uh, many successes, uh, but also uh, some disappointments um, experienced by volunteers uh, and, and sometimes involved in the neighborhood councils. Um, I've seen 
really great people with altruistic intent um, leave the neighborhood council system disappointed and um, sort of disenchanted. And I hate to see that with anyone who volunteers their free time um, on a legislative body, um, and especially when they're tasked with really advocating on what they feel is best for their community. So for years I've struggled with how do we, how do, we do what we can to enhance the volunteer experience for, for people who put their neck out on the line, don't get paid for it, to volunteer their, their time uh, and energy and talents to help their community prosper and, and, and be better. Um, and I don't know what the magic, you know, bullet is to, to help uh, that along, but uh, I think it's an area that if we can figure it out on how to, um, I don't know, better support volunteers who, who step forward and then might... Um, become, I don't know, victim to being attacked all the time for just being on a board. Um, it's not easy, uh, and we just witnessed some of the ugliness that, that uh, we hear all the time. So how do we better support volunteers who serve on our neighborhood councils so that it's more worth their while and they don't, uh, in, like I mentioned, in some cases, feel defeated by the experience? My experience with volunteer work is that people leave when they feel that they're uh, not welcome or that there's no place for them or that there's nothing for them to do that they perceive to be productive. Just to uh, just identify three of the things that, in my experience, tends to be what pushes people away. I, I also think that people leave because they can't find a way to engage they can't find a way to meet their own interest in the context of the organization, in this case the neighborhood council perhaps, that they're interested in, in serving, serving on. The, to change that experience, it's, it's important that people have a sense of what, what they can expect when they get there. And they, have a, they need to have a sense of where the connection points are for them re related to the, to the items that are of interest to them. When they start having a better experience there, they start coming back, and they'll bring others. But unless they feel like that's a space where they can actually advance the things that are inter of interest to them in a meaningful way, which doesn't mean that they will always be able to, they'll have to compromise. And so the process of compromise can be very frustrating and turn people away if it's not managed in a way that is, is balanced and allows them to feel like it's still okay to stay in the game and to come back because there are lots of things that we can be talking about. So to the extent that those opportunities are there, we need to build on that. Mm -hmm. But once somebody's interested in volunteering, it's, I think it's important to nurture them along the way and to ensure that they have a, a positive experience. Thank you. I, I think that's great. I, I think that is um, a real opportunity uh, moving forward for the long-term success of the Neighborhood Council system. Uh, and you're right, uh, in terms of attendance is really important as well. We have some neighborhood councils that there's just always a public display of, of grief and conflict, and then people just stop going to the meetings entirely, and that doesn't serve any purpose either. So um, I, I think that's a great outlook you have on, on how, how to approach that. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to your work. And I think uh, it's abundantly clear there is such a great opportunity here for neighborhood councils. I come from the neighborhood council system, and yes, there are a lot of problems, but it has survived this long and it has flourished. And I think there's more opportunity for us to use the neighborhood council system to bring Angelinos together. I mean, there's so much hate going on in the nation and the world, and, and change begins locally. Change begins one person at a time, one block at a time, one neighborhood at a time. And what better way than neighborhood councils? Um, so while there's a lot of challenges and a lot of things that need to be fixed, um, I think there's a lot of positivity in it. And look forward to, um, to all the work that we are going to do together. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. So if there's no further questions, I'd like to recommend that we approve the appointment of Ra Raquel Beltran as general manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and move this item along to the full city council. Second. Great. No objection. Seeing none, this item is approved. And congratulations, Raquel. Thank you very much.
great. Moving along to mo item number one. Um, can you read that into the record, please? Sure. Item number one is a verbal status report, status update from the City Clerk and Department of Neighborhood Empowerment relative to the election after action report. Great. Um, and I believe we have the City Clerk as well as uh, Dunn. Gracie, you want, oh, who's coming from Dunn? Okay. Mm -hmm. Come on up. And do we have any public comment for this? No public comment? Great. Um, so to the city clerk, um, so this is the first year, uh, this is the first year, I can't done. Uh, this is the first year that the city clerk's office has run the neighborhood council elections. So do you mind kicking off this discussion with the brief action report? Uh, yes, uh, Christopher Garcia, uh, city clerk. I can, I can provide that report. Uh, you're right. This is the first time that we've done the election since 2010. Um, that was the last time our office was responsible for the entire administration of the election. And this year, we uh, took it back up. Uh, we still partnered with, uh, with Dunn um, in their efforts for outreach, but we oversaw uh, everything else. Um, we conducted 81 neighborhood council elections between the end of March and about the middle of the end of June. Um, this was a long process. It, typically starts in July of the previous year, so in July 2018. Um, we do a lot of preparation, working with the neighborhood councils, going over their bylaws, establishing their election rules, developing election procedures that apply, that apply citywide. Um, then we start the, uh, the, uh, the official election season with the beginning of candidate filing, which takes place in the middle of, or the end of December. Um, that takes place, oops, sorry. Um, that uh, continues through April um, and then uh, the elections begin, so we see a staggered schedule. So, we, you know, this is 81 elections spread out over the course of six months. Um, in general, we view this election as a success, knowing full well that there are a variety of issues that uh, have to be addressed going forward. And uh, we look forward to working with the neighborhood uh, councils, with Dunn, the city attorney, and the council on addressing those issues, which I'll highlight in a, in a little bit. Uh, but we, see, we view the success in two ways, both in terms of participation um, and in administration. Uh, first, with participation, we saw an increase in both the number of voters who, who voted and uh, the number of candidates. So uh, nearly 22,800 voters cast ballots for approximately 1,800 voters, um, which compared to 2016, the turnout there was for the same number of councils was 21,647, so we saw an increase about 5%. Um, and keep in mind, this is a 5% increase without uh, a vote by mail option or an online voting option. So voters were only allowed to vote at the polls, so, and we still saw an increase in, in participation. Uh, the number of candidates who, apply, who were applied to run and were certified also increased from 2016. Um, as I said, they, there were approximately 1,800 candidates. In 2016, we had um, about 1,700 candidates who were certified to run for open board seats. And one, um, one uh, development that we saw that we were really happy about was the uh, increase in our certification rate. Um, in 2016, we only certified 82% of candidates that applied, um, whereas in 2019, we certified 93%, so we saw an 11% increase. Uh, this is largely due to a greater understanding of the qualifications needed to uh, certify a candidate, but also our staff worked closely with the candidates to, uh, to get them certified. And uh, just to kind of go off um, a little bit to address some earlier comments, we realized there were some issues with um, how verification was, uh, was viewed and what was considered you know, uh, true verification. Um, our office did uh, engage in this uh, rigorous verification process, um, and at times a uh, process that is probably more rigorous than uh, we would put normal municipal candidates through. So, um, but that, that is an issue we'll be addressing. Uh, there were 13 neighborhood council elections that were suspended for the lack of candidates necessary to hold a competitive election. Fortunately, uh, there's a process uh, provided by Dunn, a board affirmation process, which allows the, those candidates to then, then be seated and the board can continue to function with new members. So there were 13 uh, neighborhood councils that had that. Um, nearly three quarters of all the voters, uh, about 74 
0.5% um, were residents, but 9% overall identified as community interest stakeholders. Um, and then one of the our, our focal points this year was to improve poll worker training. We created an online application uh, where folks interested in serving in their local local neighborhood councils and neighborhood councils all across the city could apply. Uh, we recruited 51 poll workers through this application and we held 24 poll worker trainings held across the city between February and May. Um, we also created an election handbook that outlined uh, in more detail citywide election procedures as well as a poll worker handbook which spelled out all the procedures that were to be applied on election day. And we tried our best to, uh, to the extent possible, uh, reflect uh, these these procedures on election day reflected those that are applied on at your local municipal elections so that voters would ex have the same experience uh, going into the polls and in by and large we got a largely positive reception to them um, there were two neighborhood councils that held their first elections ever this was uh, historic cultural north and North Westwood both of these neighborhood councils uh, held subdivision elections the year prior, so this is their first true election, and um, we're, we're happy for them. Um, there were 48 election challenges filed for 22 neighborhood council elections. These are post-election challenges that um, that covered electioneering, uh, improper use of neighborhood council funds or logos, or uh, claims of illegal voting. Our office reviewed those challenges. Uh, we uh, affirmed 11 of those, and those were. Uh, we applied remedies for those, ranging from candidate disqualification to letters of reprimand. Um, this is also an area that our office is seeking to improve as well, this challenge process. Um, going forward, and uh, we are committed to working with councils and done in the city council, city attorney's office. Uh, we're engaged in getting feedback from neighborhood councils so we can address those variety of issues related to candidate filing, um, alternative voting methods such as vote by mail, uh, the election challenges, uh, clarifying neighborhood council bylaws so that we can better interpret the intent of the neighborhood councils, um, and also working on election scheduling, the timeline, because uh, some of these timelines fall around holidays and we recognize there were some difficulties with some of these boards in meeting those deadlines. So that's something that our office is willing to um, revisit and consider going forward, but we, we see this as an ongoing process. So while the elections are ended this year, we're ready to keep on keep the discussion open. Great. Thank you for that. And I know we have questions, but I want to ask Dunn to give us a report on the breakdown of the outreach conducted in advance of these elections. Uh, however, I do want to let my colleagues know that this is a verbal report. There is nothing written in case you guys are looking for something. <laughs> but I am going to ask the departments, both departments, yes. to write us a written report because this is a lot of great information. So I'll yep. give you guys a heads up on that so, so we can review it later because this is something that's an ongoing thing. But go ahead, Don. Yes, uh, Thompson, Department of Neighbor and Apartment, uh, Director of Outreach and Communications. With me are Amory Holman, our Public Information Officer, and Arun Abindian, our, uh, market, uh, our marketing uh, strategist. Uh, first of all, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the to this opportunity to, to speak here, but also to the city clerk. You know, it was a bit, uh, it was a very uh, worthwhile partnership, and I, I think the word enjoyable and dare I say fun was uh, was uh, <laughs> if I can say fun working in the city department. It's definitely you know, especially with you know, Sophia and uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and Chris right here too, yeah, Holly too, but yeah, but definitely these two as well. <laughs> So, for, so as 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 a city clerk, Mitch. Oh, she's here. Oh. Now we know what the party is. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, but then I. So with that with with that said, I, you know. Uh, so what our, in our department department's efforts is that to we have to mirror the election cycle schedule that that the city clerk mentioned, and to go back to what Raquel mentioned, the mission of our department is to make government more responsive and how to get people more involved, and how do we create our strategy that empowers the both uh, neighborhood council board members that's on the board, but also same time bringing in people that's not at the table yet, and that's a, that's our strategy kind of going forward. And to break it down, uh, we we we, d we decided to using the kind of the breakdown of the funds, we came up with our own kind of marketing brand. The critique from 2016 was that we were marketing too much of ourselves, Empower LA, Empower LA, 
and then we created a neighbor council brand marketing. I didn't. I usually bring it. I didn't. I didn't bring it today. Uh, and on top of that, we, we we broke down our elections into different phases. Uh, first phase awareness, second phase recruiting candidates, and third phase uh, voters. And some of the methods and what we did in terms of the breakdown is that we did a city. We did a full scheme of uh, grassroots uh, outreach. Uh, to reach those that don't have technical maybe advice, uh, advices, and to we also had a, 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 a extensive uh, Facebook social media digital marketing outreach, where they could explain later later on. So some of the things. So, so uh, what do we? So a couple of things. I break this down. First part. What do we do to empower the neighbor council leaders that's already on the board? Some of the things that we did is that we put together. Um, a couple of times, uh, the first citywide uh, outreach, the gathering of outreach chairs to empower, to, to give them resources. Hey, what is asset mapping? Uh, uh, social media, uh, I think some, some marketing there as well. But just how do you go out and do outreach? You know, how do you talk to people in your neighborhoods? Uh, we did that at a citywide level. We also did that twice regionally in different regions, the valley, the central, uh, the, the South LA, and, and all those areas. Uh, on top of that, we had a little gathering of then the system itself is pretty pretty dynamic in that you don 't have to be a citizen to be involved so we we, we put together uh, an outreach gathering of nonprofits and a, and a, and a panel discussion with uh, immigrant nonprofits along with the formerly incarcerated nonprofit groups as well and we also did a couple of uh, neighborhood gathering, uh, gatherings with a different nonprofit citywide to, 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 to get them you know, kind of involved with, hey, this neighbor council system is approaching. And I think what we found from those grassroots outreach, and also we hired on election assistants to go out to certain neighbor councils to do some maybe door knocking and also to, you know, to do what's called neighbor council 101s. That education piece that the Councilman O'Farrell was mentioning about is what does it mean to be a neighbor council leader? You know, what is it, what's the time commitment, you know, all that, you know, the, the important stuff. So all that to say is that out of the 1,805 uh, uh, candidates, I believe, I think 918, 51% were brand new to the system. And I think because of the scheduling reasons also, we found that that's an average from citywide, but the South LA area, because I think they went, they were, they were the last region, we have more time to work in the South LA region, we found a lot more uh, new, new members getting involved as well. So that's some of the kind of grassroots elections outreach that we did on the grassroots level. I'm going to turn this time over, over to maybe Anne Marie or Aaron talk about the digital social media. Mm. Do you want to talk about marketing first, and then I'll talk about the workshops in particular and the organic? Right. Aaron Abedian, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. So, uh, so as Tom mentioned, we did uh, the three phases. So, before I begin, uh, um, just want to explain. Uh, basically the, the, the difficulty of doing uh, marketing for neighborhood councils just because, one, they're in different regions, they have different needs, and two, there's 13 different dates. So when it comes to marketing, especially event marketing, when it comes to saying there's an election on this date, when you have 13 different dates, it becomes much more difficult to advertise. Um, same goes with uh, Canada registration, which had different uh, range of days to, to sign up. But that being said, um, some of the uh, different types of outreach that we did was uh, we had 376 next door posts going out to about 515,000 people. Um, and those are, those are individual posts that Amory did. Uh, basically, there was about two or three for both candidate registration, reminding them there's, that's happening, and also uh, election day. Uh, we had about uh, 16,000 emails going out with a 38% open rate. Uh, we had about 5.5 uh, uh, Facebook imp impressions through advertisement. So impressions are when they see a post. And uh, the reach was about 1.5 million people. So basically 1.5 million people at least, at least saw the post two to three times on Facebook advertising alone. And that brought into both our website and mostly to the city clerk website about 50,000 clicks. So that was just Facebook advertisement. We also did Twitter advertisement. We also did LinkedIn. Uh, we had about 18,000 unique visitors to our election webpage. Uh, we had 70 bus benches throughout the city, 30 in the uh, uh, NCs that needed uh, most help, th about 35. And then we had about uh, 130 bus shelters. Uh, we had news newspaper publications, about 30 of them. We had 16 uh, election videos, one of them being uh, from Council Member David Rue. Um, we had nine candidate workshops, which Emery will talk about, and. Uh, 
and as far as as far as uh, what what worked and what didn't, you know, we uh, we tried this time a different strategy because uh, uh, in the last elections it was hard to collect information on what what strategies work out and what strategies don't. Just because in order to understand, in order to spend the money and then uh, do do it some type of uh, strategy and then tie that to actual candidates, it's pretty difficult because the, the funnel that goes through that is, is a long funnel. So one thing that we tried this time is by having unique links on different uh, marketing material. For instance, on our bus benches and bus shelters, we put unique links so that we can see how many people are coming from there. Now, it still doesn't give us a good, good number because somebody might have learned about neighborhood council elections, so we did our awareness phase, but they might have not converted. Uh, so we might have still been successful. But I just wanted to point out that this time around we did some more, uh, you know, we tried to gather more data on a lot of the things that we could possibly do. And up to the point of actually getting it up to our website, we have those metrics. But, you know, we don't know if they converted all the way through or not. But we're still learning, you know, we're still going to try to improve that process to, to find out um, what strategy works out best at, at the end. Thank you. Great. I have a question to each, and then uh, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, on that, um, Oh, yo, there's more. Okay, all right. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> Hi, Anne-Marie Holman, Public Information Officer. Um, just to add briefly to the level of complexity of doing outreach for these elections, besides the fact that you have 13 different dates that are semi-regional, but sometimes they can combine neighborhood councils from totally different sides of the city, rolling over a six-month period, you also have 99 different sets of election rules. Some neighborhood councils actually have a process called selection and don't participate in the election season at all. Others have completely different rules between councils, and so when you're talking about the elections, you have to make sure that in order for somebody to be able to successfully cast a ballot, that they're actually exposed to what the rules are for their council. In some councils, for example, if you don't have a copy of your mortgage, you actually can't vote for certain people on the ballot. The mortgage? Your mortgage, yes, or maybe your rental lease agreement. Now, these aren't things that you naturally just think to put in your pocket on a Sunday <laughs> when you're out on a walk. So, no, you know, of course. So, because of that, it's important that people know these things so they can be enfranchised. And so... Speaking broadly, I noticed that our most successful efforts were the ones where we were able to deliver the complex, individuated information to the voters. We had 425 people from 98 councils respond to our post-election survey, and by far the most successful efforts were always those that delivered the individuated information. Another thing that really helped us a great deal this year was doing candidate workshops. We had 348 students in nine workshops that we partnered on with the city clerk. We also had a series of nine additional workshops that were targeted for gender issues and candidates run through our Ignite program, which were separate. In the workshops that we held together, we talked about not just the registration process, but also how to find out which election rules pertained to you as a candidate and to your specific seat, because not every voter could vote for every seat on the ballot, depending on your stakeholder type. So armed with that information, and each person got the packet, emailed to them afterwards, whoever signed up and whoever attended, that helped us create a pool of high-capacity candidates who were armed with the knowledge they needed to hit the ground running. It actually helped us create a bullpen as well to fill vacancies. We had some people attend who, whose election enrollment date had passed, but they were actually able to take up a vacant seat on the board they were targeting themselves toward. This also took recruitment pressure off of neighborhood councils. Many board members had asked us to please do something about the fact that they were being asked to recruit their own opponents for these elections. By advertising our own workshops and by reaching out to candidates on our own, we took that, that conflict out of the mix a little bit. So I'm, I'm very proud of how those turned out. I would like to add an onboarding workshop as a follow-up, because that's something that I heard a great deal of in our post-election feedback sessions. Great. Um, I think that concludes the report. Anything else? Good. Great. Um, well, thank you. And, you know, uh, I have a question each for both departments. Um, since we're uh, done with answering, and, um, and it looks like the outreach was successful, and I know we gave additional funding for um, uh, uh, was appropriate for um, outreach, but you were actually, uh, I don't know if you could answer this question yet, because you were actually talking about it. 
what I what I was curious was about was um, like what percentage, not the actual dollar amount. It could be the dollar amount or percentage was spent on like neighbor council 101, outreach workshops, social media, uh, community organization partnerships, digital ads, TV, and you know all the different breakdowns that you did. So basically, how much was spent on each one of those categories, and you were kind of talking about it, but what was the most effective? If or is that data still coming back to you? All right, from the Department of Urban Empowerment. Uh, so yeah, the data still we're, we're looking at the data um, as far as what's effective. Like I mentioned, one thing that we try to do this time is capture. Uh, those that aren't digital. So how do you capture a flyer? How is, mm -hmm. Does the flyer work or not? I mean, you look at a flyer, you went on the website, you sign up as a candidate. How do we know that? So one of the things that we did, like I said, is we put uh, uh, on posters and flyers, we put unique links. And uh, just based on um, what we got back as far as those people going to their website, posters and flyers still work. So I would say that's one of the strategies that we're going to do again. Um, so um, with, with Facebook, you know, it's easy to see if something works per dollar amount. So I think definitely Facebook advertisement, especially because in Facebook advertisement, you can uh, target local neighborhoods. So we're definitely going to do that again. I think that was a su mm -hmm. su success. Um, one of the strategies that we did this time around, we, we hired three special, uh, specialized uh, marketing people to help us with elections. And I think that was a big success. Uh, one of them did uh, the Facebook advertisement. Um, one of them did uh, press releases and another did email marketing. So I think going forward, uh, I would definitely suggest uh, to continue hiring spe uh, people that are specializing in certain tasks because it puts less pressure on us to remember to do things or, uh, you know, uh, to in general be uh, yeah. involved in an uh, outreach. So for Facebook, you, you mentioned you had 1.5 million impressions. Do you know how much of that was in the city? It was actually uh, about 5 million impressions, but 1.5 people, 1.5 oh, million, million people. million people, yeah. So yeah. do you know, how, were they all in the city? Yeah, they're all in the city. Wow. I mean, it's, 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 based, on, it's based on what their Facebook profile says. Mm -hmm. So right. they might live in the city. Uh, uh, they, they will be living in the city uh, when you're signing up as Facebook. So they could have... Right, they, they could have live been, in Anaheim, but they still consider that L.A. A lot of people, right? So, right, it was, yeah. it was based on the zip code. Right, what, they, what yeah. they mentioned, okay. Things based on zip code. And Nextdoor, how did, uh, did, does Nextdoor allow um, Don to um, post? Yeah, I'm going to let uh, Amory answer that one. Okay. Yes, we actually have one of the first citywide accounts that Nextdoor ever established oh, right. anywhere. Our account is an umbrella account that includes a subsection for each neighborhood council. I could actually go down and post to the level of the individual communities within oh, that wow. council if I wished, and so could the neighborhood councils. Each council is able to have access as an administrator to their own area. And then in addition, I can, I can post to an, a region, for example. So. When I was advertising things like workshops, I'd hit a region. Sometimes I would just hit one specific council. If that council was very, very active on Nextdoor to avoid, avoid spamming stakeholders, I would reel mine back or time mine a little bit differently. Wow. It's a really refined tool. You can share that information with, the, with all the city council offices because that's a new development. I know we yes, finally absolutely. got LAPD ability to post, but mm -hmm. that's great. Um, and if you could, in the written report, if you could give us all of the breakdowns and once you get more of an analysis, and I know there's no perfect uh, tracking mechanism, but it, it would be fascinating to see. Certainly. If I, and one, one last thing regarding this is that definitely we're going to explore the next door digital media uh, Facebook. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that we found that in order to start for the next elections, we, we definitely need to start sooner than later, almost like tom tomorrow. And where that, where, where that comes in is that I mentioned the, the system is for those that are in the system that's not on the system. And some of the folks are first time, you know, monolingual speaking, you know, uh, whatever the language is. So that th those type of relationships need time to develop through Either NC 101s, we're working with the nonprofits for those groups. So that's why the the speed. That's why it's hard, kind of hard to quantify the NC 101s, you know, work. But we, we're going to continue doing that. But we see that as a successful in South LA, just because that that was the you know because that 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 way the most lead time to do some of the work there. So okay. there's I think still old fashioned relationship <laughs> building still still yeah. works. Uh, and I, I want to move more quickly. Uh, so for the city clerk, when you talk about verification, I know in particular uh, there was verification issues all, all throughout, I know. Uh, but the one about applying uniform criteria for stakeholder status, right? Because there are inconsistencies in the neighborhood council bylaws across across the board. And you were talking about that you're trying to address that. But can you elaborate on uh, on that for us and what, what, what you're planning to do in future years to ensure that the council approved stakeholder definition is in effect? Yes. Um, 
So when it comes to uh, uniform stakeholder status, um, we're talking about the two, the, the four major stakeholder status, live, work, own property. We have general guidelines that we can follow for each of those broad categories um, and that we do adhere to when we are processing voters or processing candidates, especially candidates since we apply more scrutiny there. Um, and that is a process that we can continue with the definition, um, if, whether it's the current definition or the, the, the definition that's proposed. Uh, we, with the, we are able to take that broad approach and then apply it down to the individual neighborhood councils where we do see those differences. Um, so for example, um, one neighborhood council may expand upon, say, a community interest definition by defining what they consider a community organization to be, whereas another neighborhood council may only just make reference to community interest stakeholders without that further definition. So while we try to apply citywide uniform standards, we also try to remain true to each neighborhood council's intent and remain consistent within that neighborhood council's understanding of, you know, who is a resident, who is a community interest stakeholder, et cetera. Um, and we're confident that we can continue that under the new uh, definition, which does provide us more guidance as to, you know, especially for community interest, what, um, who those folks are, so. Okay, well, well thank you. I wanna open up to colleagues. I have a couple of quick questions. Um, to Anne-Marie first, you mentioned that you had a pretty good rate of return on your questionnaire or your survey. Right, over 500 responses? 425 so far. Okay, yeah. that's, that's pretty decent. So hopefully, Thank you. just a suggestion in the next, um, when, when there's a written report, maybe include some of the, the, the finer points of what came back, because that could be very valuable. Oh, absolutely. We've got feedback from that as well as feedback from the, we held sessions in person around the city, mm -hmm. and I have that all in a spreadsheet that I'll include along with the report. Okay, that'll be helpful. Yeah. Really great work. Everyone. Thanks so much. And then a question for the clerk, uh, uh, and that is, just out of curiosity, uh, I remember back in the day, you know, some of the, the conflict in terms of territories and all that, neighbor council boundaries, right? Uh, how many subdivisions have there been recently in terms of neighbor councils splitting into two different ones or, or whatever, reconfiguring? Um, in total, I believe there have been uh, five subdivision elections. Uh, the most recent were the three from last year. Those were for uh, the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council, Wilshire Center, Koreatown, and the Westwood Neighborhood Council. Mm -hmm. Two out of those three were successful. Uh, so that's why we saw the uh, Historic Cultural North Neighborhood Council and the, uh, West, the Westwood, North Westwood Neighborhood Council. Um, with subdivisions potentially being put on hold, uh, we're not sure um, exactly how many we'll see in the future, but that is something that we'll be working with the department on mm -hmm. uh, since that's a process they oversee in initiating that with the neighbor councils and the proponents of subdivision. Just curious if, if that's a downward trend or an upward trend in terms of the subdivision efforts. Hmm. Just out of curiosity. And I, I sense that they've kind of calmed down and, and the boundaries are more or less settled, but I don't wanna just assume that's the case. Yeah, we need to do a little more research on that. I think it's, uh, it's, I, I think it's either, near, either here or there. I think it's, uh, I don't think it's, like, no, 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 definitely answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you both. I think it's important, uh, you know, when our departments are working together collaboratively, so I think it's significant that the clerk's office and Dunn have, have come together uh, to uh, just provide the guidance and leadership in a very, very important area. One thing I'd like to focus a little bit more on is how we are engaging our young people in this process. It seems like it's an excellent way, you know, engaging the high school students, kind of pr priming them for uh, community service uh, and uh, with the uh, neighbor councils. Anything specifically we're doing or how, how do we interact with, with the high schools specifically? Yeah, well, uh, Tom, so again. Uh, we have a program called Civic Youth that, that, that works to get involved uh, high school kids involved with um, uh, civic engagement. So they were notified about getting involved with, uh, you know, running for, running for seats. We also have a, a, we had a targeted workshop called Ignite that we had, uh, I think it was eight workshops, eight, eight workshops uh, working with um, 
young young women, uh, future women leaders as, as well. And when we did the NC citywide, or just in South LA, or just in the no, Valley, no, or where did you do this? Citywide, citywide, mm -hmm. yeah. And then for the for the South LA area, you know, we we've you know, there's a C to I coalition folks that works with Leo, the place called home. There's the CRCD organizations that, and we did some uh, uh, coffees with the principals as well, you know, to get the, to, to, you know, the principals on board, get the parents involved, the parents involved, get the, get the, get the, get the folks on board. Now, we, when we talk about the younger folks, I'm thinking of also like millennials too. So we did partner with, uh, city, uh, with, a, with organization, organizations such as uh, Global Shapers, uh, that they, they were, they, they found us, right? And then they're the organization that, uh, that's like a young millennials working professional group. And they were they were committed What's the name? to the same that group? global global shapers, and they were they were they were committed to you know kind of having their own goals of getting candidates on the neighboring council boards as well. So definitely a push to get some more young folks on, involved. And we're doing a demographic uh, survey right now of board members. You know, and one of the questions we're asking is is the age question. You know, are we how how, how are we doing on the age? We know the youngest. Who's the youngest one? Youngest one is uh, fifteen. The youngest candidate that we had was fifteen years old this year. Yeah. And if I may, uh, Sofia Anguiano with the Office of the City Clerk. The City Clerk also has an outreach component in the department where we typically throughout the school year go out to present to the neighborhood count, I'm sorry, to the high schools to talk to them about getting civically engaged uh, for the purposes of voting for their next presidential election. But we also introduce the local level getting involved in the neighborhood councils, that they can run for board seats when the elections are. So that's something that's ongoing with our department. Yeah, and I think it, it, that bleeds into the next item that we're going to hear where um, we're going to uniformly across the city allow uh, 16 and over to vote in neighborhood council elections. So uh, that's going to be a uniform thing that we're going to be pursuing. But uh, if there's no other questions, um, I am going to request a written report because there's so much things that were covered and we could probably talk long and on about this, but if a written report about the uh, neighborhood council election after action report from both the city clerk and Don. Um, and this is, uh, uh, there's no formal instruction here. It was just a report, so it's my understanding. Um, um, but I really want to thank uh, both departments for a job well done. And there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I'm so excited the city clerk's on board as well. Um, I know the stakeholder definition and verification and all of that is very um, a tense topic. Um, and we need to really figure that out. But at the same time, I am also very cognizant of the fact that the whole point of neighboring in councils is for engagement, increase engagement, increase voting. So we do not want to make it so hard where they have to be carrying their um, mortgage uh, mortgage papers to vote because it's actually, we want to, it's supposed to be easier to vote for your neighborhood council members than your council members or president of the United States, right? So, um, and it's a fine balance there, but I know uh, we'll be able to solve it, but thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, item number three. City clerk. City Attorney done to report relative to updates on the status of the neighborhood council system reforms. Great. Uh, if the the city clerk Don and city attorney's office could come on up, and uh, we have uh, we have one. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one public comment. If I could have a seat open, Darcy Harris. Thank you, Darcy. Give you a minute. Um, I'm the chair of the Echo Park Neighborhood Council, and uh, we did file a community impact statement on this council file. Okay, so we could give you five minutes. Okay, great. Uh, try not to use it all. Um, all right, so as I said, I'm the chair of the Echo Park Neighborhood Council, newly elected, and I've been the chair of the bylaws committee for the last three years. And about two years ago, we overhauled all our bylaws, and we had extensive discussion, and, and we decided to change the age of our board members, so the minimum age to 18 across the board, it had been 16. And we did it for several reasons. And so now I'm concerned, I, I know, I see in the report that it's, it's clear there's gonna be a minimum voting age of 16, and we all agreed, we agreed with that. Um, but I've been hearing that there's a possible interpretation that there'd be a uniform minimum age, that the, that the interpretation of uniform minimum age for board members being 16 is not just a minimum, but actually it would require us to keep every seat available to 16 year olds. So if that's the interpretation, I see a lot of problems with that um, because each individual neighbor council should be able to tailor their bylaws 
to some to what they their community wants um, and for instance that would preclude a senior citizen seat um, and in general I do I just think we found it a troublesome policy because anyone under 18 under the current uh, city attorney rules can't vote on any funding matters I believe they can't vote on any planning and land use matters I'm I've heard that I'm trying to pin that down and see if that's true but if that's true that's you know most a lot of what the important issues that we weigh in on that have practical effects it's what all our stakeholders get most excited and are concerned about is fiscal matters and land use matters so there's possibly even an issue with quorum <laughs> if you had I mean it's probably unlikely but if you had a lot of of young people and you had vacancies you you could maybe not vote on certain matters um, but aside from that we're we're elected to represent the people of our community and we can make speeches but if, eventually we have to vote and take a stand and if we if we have a lot of people or even several who are not able to vote it's we're doing a disservice to our community so we strongly feel that if a board wants to allow 16 year olds to run they should but we also think we could make the decision find that balance and say no we want it to be 18 or have a senior citizen seat so to the extent um, that's in consideration I'd like you to either consider not interpreting it that way or if you are going to make um, seats available to all 16 year olds then you need to revisit whether they can vote on funding and land use matters um, I do just want to um, briefly mention the other items in the report I saw on the shared space I think it's great that we're gonna find ways to encourage the city property Actually, I'm so sorry you yep. can't you have to only speak on this item you can't speak on other items that you would have to sign up for general public comment on that it's one. in the report that's on item three. Oh, oh I'm sorry I thought you were talking about I was looking at the next item sorry, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so so the other items in the report just briefly I wanted to um, mention there's a there's the Dunn is working on shared space with city owned properties but I I would and in our community impact statement we did reference a motion that the funding equity work group that I was on passed uh, to also ask to share to negotiate an agreement with LAUSD to really cooperate because sometimes you can use the school sometimes you can't it's very cumbersome um, and then lastly I did want to address uh, Councilmember O'Farrell's <coughs> question about burnout and um, you know we're we're volunteers we have a lot of regulations burdening us we are subject to the Brown Act so we can't meet we can't get things done uh, for mo for normal legislature legislators you have paid staff who can help implement and we don't um, and there's a lot of paperwork so another recommendation we had was for the department to to uh, assign people to help with the secretarial and the Treasury duties that are really administrative so we don't have to spend so much time on those things and um, we can spend time outreaching talking to our stakeholders and discuss and trying to you know influence policy and do projects and do what our job is instead of all this paperwork so thank my you suggestion thanks Darcy. thank you thank you so very much and um, and uh, so I want to have um, Gracie kick this off and um, possibly even answer some of those questions sure but if you give us an update on where we are with the implementation of the neighborhood council systems reforms sure uh, Gracie Lou interim general manager for the Department of Empowerment good afternoon council members uh, as you see for the report we did a very brief um, um, update on the reforms and just wanted to add to certain areas that inadvertently were left out and also address some of the concerns that Darcy raised um, in under best practices uh, we are gathering the best practices information for neighbor councils and we have shared them in the past the, the information that we do have we're trying to consolidate it into on something that's more you know uh, searchable and as part of that is also um, includes the uh, phone numbers and the contact information for the departments um, on a variety of issues not just the um, civic engagement um, information that was on in that section specifically um, to for um, selections um, which is on the second page the bottom of the second page um, we wanted to note that while selections can be very successful um, we just like a neighbor council going through an election if the neighborhood council doesn't have enough candidates running or they're not doing any outreach then we'll see we'll see like a dip in numbers and we've seen that with other neighbor councils that went from an election to a selection um, where they struggled for a few years to even get enough people to besides uh, you know they get enough people to run and those people would just essentially just vote for themselves and so it would be like 
you know, 20 people voting in a selection, and they would just vote themselves in, and then, you know, they, they would have a term. Um, but recently, with one of those selection neighborhood councils, we were able to um, get them back to their, like, back into the high 200s, um, only because we assisted with some um, outreach and to make sure that they had enough candidates running. Um, in regards to um, the voting age, um, the uniform voting age that's 16 um, is actually what we also recommended back in 2016 after the elections. And we think that, you know, it was an equity issue. Like youth can, in some parts of the city could participate in neighbor councils and other parts they were not allowed to participate at all. So um, that's why we recommend 16. Um, we, that was a voting age and was necess not necessarily the participation age in terms of being the, uh, the board member because we do note that, you know, neighbor councils are self governing independent they do have the ability to to um, ask that their boards be structured in a certain way so um, we left that um, out of the um, actual 16 years uh, old category um, LAUSD GSD in terms of shared space um, in the past we've had issues um, getting information about what was actually available um, with GSD, uh, we are continuing working with them to make the process easier to share space and to identify that space. Um, we also obviously use some um, GIS, GIS mapping um, of uh, what the spaces that we know of that are available, and we provide that to neighbor councils. For LAUSD, we have spoken to them in the past, and it really depends on the principal. Um, they, they're they very independent in that way, and so every neighborhood council usually has to negotiate with their principal of the schools to get that meeting space. Um, and as for administrative funds to or funding or resources to help neighborhood councils with administrative um, duties or even funding duties, that's part of what their their annual funding is supposed to be. If you go back to some of the folks who were around when they gave the 50000 initially, they'll say that that actually was for operational costs um, to, to hire people to do this um, uh, to, to support the administrative, fund, uh, administrative and funding functions. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have that report. Um, thank you. Um, Yes, uh, for, yeah, it looks like most of the reforms are underway, and uh, however, establishing a departmental liaison or point of contact uh, and rollover of neighborhood council funds, which went, to, uh, early, which went into effect earlier this year, weren't included in their report. So can you give me an update on those two items? Sure. So um, in, part, in regards to the department liaison, that is part of the best practices part that we um, inadvertently left out, and we are preparing that, and um, we'll likely have that ready by the Congress, which is uh, September 28th. Um, and as re regarding the rollover, um, that was administered by the city clerk, and I'm sure um, it was instituted um, last fiscal year, and I'm sure Melvin would have an update on that. Okay, great. And uh, for the city attorney, I understand in order to effectuate the uh, system-wide minimum board member and voting ages, we need to do an ordinance. Can you walk us through that, um, what's required for that to happen? Yes. Good afternoon, Elise Rudin, City Attorney, Neighborhood Council Advice Division. Um, because this would be a policy change, uh, we would recommend, it's our opinion, that a ordinance would need to be uh, uh, accomplished in order to uh, get to that goal. And that would also then uh, affect the executive branch because it's a department. Mm -hmm. So that would be our recommendation. That's our advice. Okay, and just to clarify, um, well, in that ordinance, we could direct the city attorney to make clarifications on basically if it's just for voting as well as for running for uh, which seats. Uh, and um, it would be, so currently it would be subject just to the vote um, youth seat or would it be for every uh, every seat? So the vote, the uniform voting age would be for all the seats. Um, oh, but what I mean, um, with the uniform, as, quite, as asked earlier by one of the neighborhood councils, would that allow for any 16-year-old to run for every single one of the board seats? Well, we, that would be up to how, how, we how you write it. Right. right. Um, and in the past, we did not recommend that, only because of, you know, the, the nature of the seats, as mentioned by Darcy, you know, they would make, wouldn't necessarily make sense right. for a senior 
see to have so we could tailor make the ordinance to uh, be, uh, have that uh, 18 and 16 and 16 to 18 year olds could only run they could vote in all seats but they could only run for the youth seat if that's what uh, this commission would uh, committee would uh, wish to do yeah. uh, just to bear in mind it was mentioned there are some issues with competency in terms of fiscal uh, right votes. and that's the other question I was going to ask and I think one of the main reasons to do that is there could be a possibility you could have all 16 year olds for all the seats and <laughs> currently as I I mean you know the, which will be a good sure. thing in many ways but um, but it's currently my understanding of just to confirm that under 18 cannot vote on any land use or budget issues Current contract. And contract, contract, and contract yeah, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so then that, by default, <laughs> and it could even be even if it was half the neighbor or fifty-one percent of neighbor council, they would have some voting issues. Yeah. So, I think that's one of the reasons why. So, um, any questions, colleagues? That that was a big one. I think we just yeah. got answered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think we ought to do all we can to encourage a more youthful participation. I know there's some legal restrictions, but anything we can do to uh, permit. Uh, you know, those 16, 17, 18, well, 16, 17 year olds to participate, I think helps, helps our democracy. Uh, when I was in legislature, I chaired the uh, Assembly Elections Committee. And one of the initiatives we were looking at several years ago was permitting 17 year olds to pre register to vote in advance of the. And I think, in fact, the legislature took some action uh, this year. That's automatic. This year around that. So I think anything we can do to encourage. Um, civic engagement, civic responsibility early uh, with our youth is a good thing. And so I just uh, support efforts to make that happen. Thank you. Great. Uh, and seeing that um, I do have a recommendation here for the city attorney, I would recommend that we request the city attorney draft an ordinance implementing a system-wide minimum voting age and board member age of 16 years, but also make clarification in an or ordinance about what we just discussed. Uh, about uh, clarifying on what that means for voting, as well as what seats they could run for, and um, and also re-clarifying current existing policy of um, what under 18 can't vote on. So you, you could clean up that language yeah. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Chair, you did you did use the term minimum uh, board member age of 16 as well. But yeah. we're, but what we're talking about is not requiring that of neighborhood councils, right. but permitting it. Per, but right. allowing it as per what a, whatever the neighborhood council's choice is, right? But not making that yes. part of the ordinance. But but uh, allowing 16 year olds to vote in in the entire system. Mm -hmm. That's that's the goal. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I just sorry sorry. I just want to clarify that the there's an instruction for the city attorney's office to draft an ordinance requiring every neighborhood council to allow 16 year olds to vote. Separately permitting neighborhood councils at their election. To allow 16 to 18 year olds to be members, is that correct? Well, do we need an extra ordinance for that? No, I think that's already the case. So, but I mean, uh, but I think we want to clarify, and uh, the city attorney could come back to us at a later date if we don't need to clarify um, on it. But we just want to make sure that just because we let every 16 year old, every anyone 16 over could vote, does not mean that. Um, the neighbor, the neighbor councils will have the ability to restrict on which seats they could run for, because they can't run. Doesn't mean it's not a blanket rule that every 16-year-old could vote and run for every seat. Right. right. Yeah. So we're talking yeah. about al allowing a 16-year-old to sit on the board of a neighborhood council, should that neighborhood council choose to allow it. But we're talking about requiring all neighborhood uh, councils to allow 16-year-olds to vote. Right. That's. Yeah. Well, I think we're all saying this. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, city attorney could give us. A, we're going to vote yeah. on the ordinance before yeah. we. We're going to see the ordinance before the written ordinance before we vote on it. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We were conferring. Because um, we do know that there are some neighborhood councils that are that even younger than 16 to vote. So I, I this would. I, I, so this might clear. This would make them raise their voting age. That's then. A good point. Yes. How, how young do some of them go? Just. Out of curiosity. 14, 14. and at 12. It doesn't, it doesn't 12? 12? 14 and 12, okay. yeah, yeah. I believe so there's a... We had a 12-year-old on a neighbor just, council. Just to clarify, I don't <laughs> think what their instruction is is setting a max, a, a minimum. I think it's saying it, it's requiring them to at least allow 16-year-olds, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I thought it, this is, no, minimums. Uh, well, mac, would it be a maximum? Or is it, it would be 16 and over only. So it would bring up... So I... I, I I can't find the notes here, but I think out of the 99 neighborhood councils, there's a f 
few, about four or something like that, who uh, allow 14 and over to vote, right? Uh, we have um, 15 neighborhood councils that would need to increase their minimum voting Right, age. so 15 neighborhood councils would have to increase their voting age to 16. And there are how many neighborhood councils that are 18 and over? Um, we would need uh, 38 that we need to lower the mini. So 38 minimum. would lower. And that would be, and that would make all 99 neighborhood co councils consistent at 16. Do, do you want to come on up, Carmen? Yeah. Concerns? Yeah. Deputy City Attorney Carmen Hawkins, uh, Council Member, there would be a concern if you made a minimum age of 16 in that if there are neighborhood councils that allow uh, some youth seats to be as of age 14, and I think there's at least one that's 12, then those individuals who are running for those seats would be disenfranchised of not being able to participate and vote. So we may want you may want to think further on making a you know like a mandatory minimum mm. because of the balance you know of who can actually run for a seat versus who can vote for that same yeah. seat. Thank you for that. So what we'll ask for is we'll instruct the city attorney to work with uh, Dunn. Uh, to, uh, uh, to clarify on this language, because the intent here is to make it easier on elections. The intent is to have some, some form of uniformity um, um, to, so that when come 2021, um, and we heard the report just in the earlier item where there are so many different varieties in neighborhood councils. So the goal here is try to come to a compromise and have some sort of uniform system. So uh, if the city attorney could work with Dunn um, and the city clerk to figure out um, um, the best system of the voting age, minimum or maximum, however you phrase it, and the, act, and the additional implications that it also has on all the other structural systems. I think you heard the intent of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make your lives simpler <laughs> and the neighbor council's lives simpler, so at least we have some sort of consistency. So if you guys could work it out together and, and come up with, if you have to bring two or three variations of an ordinance, so be it. Just let our offices know. Okay? Do you want to add something? Uh, well, if you wish, I can make a report, an uh, update on the uh, rollover. That was one of the instructions to city. Uh, oh, right. Rollover. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Council Members. Uh, Melvin Cañas, uh, Program Manager for the Neighborhood Council Funding Program at the Office of the City Clerk. So uh, f uh, following on your uh, uh, instructions in, of, uh, uh, regarding this matter, uh, our office moved to uh, implement the uh, rollover policy uh, starting as early as uh, January when we first announced it to neighborhood councils mm -hmm. uh, through a, a updated uh, policies and, and guidelines. Uh, subsequent to that, we had some discussion, uh, f further input uh, that we included, and a, a final uh, policy uh, process was implemented in, in early April for neighborhood councils to roll over uh, a maximum of $10,000 in any given fiscal year. So as a general process, uh, neighborhood councils uh, do not need to request a rollover, uh, meaning that the boards do not need to approve a, any, any motion or action to request the rollover funds uh, from the funding program. Uh, any funds uh, remaining at the end of the uh, fiscal year closing, uh, up to 10,000 maximum, will roll over into uh, their next fiscal year uh, regular allocation. Uh, to give you some general numbers right now, uh, give this we just concluded uh, the, you know, the last fiscal year. We closed it. And just to give you some initial numbers from this first year, uh, we had about uh, $629,000 that rolled over mm. uh, in total. Uh, for uh, all 99 neighborhood councils had uh, some amount of rollover. Uh, the average was about 6300 uh, that rolled over, uh, with the lowest um, uh, rollover amount being $4.26. <coughs> For the West Side Neighborhood Council. Some good accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a, a 27 neighborhood councils out of the 99 that rolled over the maximum 10,000. So the policy, uh, the process was put into place, was implemented as you requested, and at this point, uh, it's moving forward. Thank you. So we're going to note and file this item, but at the same time, I'm going to make that recommendation to make that motion. Do I need to repeat that motion or? About the uh, uh, city uh, city attorney working with city clerk and done. No, sir. I think it's clear. I think I would just only add an additional recommendation to allow the city attorney's office to make any amendments to the requested ordinance to be consistent with the law. Sure. Yeah. Well, 
Great. If, uh, as amended. Um, and um, I need a second for that. A second. Great. Thank you. And so moved. So that's what we'll do. Thank you. Oh, and um, um, and actually, Carmen, I'm glad you came back. Uh, can we have, uh, can okay. we recognize Carmen stand up yeah, and Gracie yeah, stand up? Yeah. This is how dedicated our staff is and our, our city family is. This is literally, uh, we had a, a, a farewell and a um, retirement celebration for Carmen last week, but I mean, she could have taken this week vacation off, but no, she's like, I I'm going to be here. So thank you so very much. I'm glad you're here. And of course, Gracie, um, all the work that she did, and, but she's not going far. She's going right over, and, you know, uh, and I'm sure Dunn's going to call you all the time <laughs> because to fill all those staff positions. So, but thank you so very much for both of your work. Thank you so much. And our last item, item number four. If you could read it in. City administra Administrative Office report relative to the proposed revised agreement with the, ta with the Tavern at Rancho Park LLC for the redevelopment, operation, and maintenance of the food and beverage concession at Rancho Park Golf Course. Okay. Do we have any public comment for this item? Yeah. Okay. Could I get Greg Plummer, Nick Cruz, and Aggie? Is it Aggie? Whoever can start first, state your name for the record. Uh, Nicholas Cruz. Good afternoon, distinguished council members, staff, and thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of agenda item four and the approval of the, of the contract for the Tavern at Rancho Park. My name is Nicholas Cruz. I'm the president of Cruz and the Tavern at Rancho Park. We're excited about this project and the opportunity, uh, and I want to give you some background about our company and the future partners and the future redevelopment of this operation. We're a family-owned business that has been innovating hospitality experiences since our humble beginnings in 1972. Our company has partnered with the City of Los Angeles with operations at LAX since 1994. Core tenets to our continued success are partnership, operational excellence, innovation, and integrity. Not only did I grow up in the hospitality business, but I live in Los Angeles, and I have personally overseen the recent redevelopment of operations of our nine locations at LAX since 2009. I've seen firsthand how the right private public partnerships can truly rehabilitate iconic assets like LAX and provide world-class facilities for guests. And we look forward to partnering with Rec and Park to do the same for the iconic Rancho Park Golf Course. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished council members and the public. My name is Greg Plummer. I am the small business partner on the Tavern at Rancho Park project, and I am grateful to stand here before you. It's uh, truly been quite a journey to get to this stage here today, and we're, at, we're asking for your support and approval of this item today to move forward to council. Um, it's truly been a labor of love. Over the last several months, we got a chance to speak with a number of the community leaders, um, residents around the Rancho Park, golfers, uh, the, the stakeholders, and quite frankly, anyone who had anything to share about this project, and we understand there's a lot of passion. There is some concern that's been raised, but there's mostly excitement about the project, and we're prepared to um, work collaboratively with the city of L.A., Rex and Park, and investing about $4.4 million in um, elevating the experience of this iconic golf course. And we thank you for the opportunity, and uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. My name is Richard Aggie. Are we now restricted to one minute on yes, these? I apologize. One minute, yeah. If we could restart this time, yes. One minute. Well, uh, there's no objection to these gentlemen or, or, or their firm. That's not what the, what the issue is. The issue is that the, the matter cannot proceed except under an exemption, and there has been an expansion of use in three particulars, which is detailed in a letter that you have received. I can't detail them in the remaining 43 seconds, but they include adding a brewery. That's an ex a substantial expansion of use. By their own words, they say that the breweries will reach out to millennials through uh, Facebook and other processes. So they're looking for non-golfers at this golf course for the brewery. They're converting a locker room in order to hamper old people and, ha and handicapped people because they now have to drag their clubs from home into the car and then back out at the course where instead of keeping them at the locker room and what they want to have is a party room or what they call the banquet hall <coughs> in department speak 
which is going to occupy 100 people who are not golfers, there for parties and non non golf events. The third, one other well, thing. Finish up. The third item is the uh, destruction of the exterior of the premises, 40% of it, in order to add seating for the restaurant, outside seating, including a deck. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned, oh, the, which is the Parklands Act, and they're in violation of that to, to eliminate what are now strictly golf Thank uses, you. such as the locker room, into non-golf. And you can submit any of your um, information as well. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, if I could get the department to come on up. And before, I'm gonna, yeah. So before we uh, have the department uh, uh, give a little presentation, I'd like to note for the record that Council District 5 has submitted a letter of support for the revised agreement which you have in front of you. Wait, was there more speakers? Yeah. Uh, Did you guys sign up? I signed up for a public hearing. Oh, okay. Then you know what? I'm sorry. I I'll, I'll take it. Uh, come on up. You guys, you guys could get a minute each. Come on up. State your name for the record. Oh, well, no. You could sit. You got to speak into the. Yeah. Last year, I was walking up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Ty Jackson. Uh, I jotted a few things down. Uh, I'm here on behalf of a group called Friends of Rancho Park Golf Course. Uh, we're representing several res uh, residents and golfers alike. Uh, as a golfer, I care about the environment. Uh, we have voiced our concern and objections about this large project to several city officials, neighborhood councils as well, many of which have fallen on conveniently closed ears. Uh, the idea of building a brewery in the middle of a golf course and residential neighborhood is incomprehensible, to say the least. Um, we all can agree that proper tire kicking study, like the CEQA, is paramount in determining the true and specific impact this project has on the golfing community, Cheviot Hills, um, crime, reducing uh, the workload on the Los Angeles Police Department, and the like. I doubt that there's anyone here that would object to that. Um, so it's really important just to, am I out of time? Just close it up real quick. It's really important, in a nutshell, it's just important to have somebody with skills um, on the effect on the community just come by and take a look at um, all of the adverse reactions of a brewery. Okay, That's thank you, saying. thank you. If you could state your name. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ahmad Mizban. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Friends of Rancho Park Golf Course, representing many residents and golfers of Rancho Park Golf Course. Um, as you know, Rancho Park Golf Course uh, House is a historical building, and such a large project will permanently uh, impact this structure. Uh, major PGA Championships was uh, at this golf course for many years, and famous golfers like Arnold Palmer uh, played here and won championships, uh, uh, adding to the historical value of this course. Uh, two large patios on each side of the building will permanently change the look of this structure. Furthermore, we believe that city codes do not allow the city of Los Angeles to build a brewery inside a park. We strongly <coughs> object to this project and want the city to further examine the impact of this huge project on this historical structure. There is an unknown impact to the environment with the addition of the brewery. Also, the air traffic and noise impact is unknown and must be uh, addressed before moving forward. Um, uh, just, you know, the law firm is ready to take any actions necessary to ensure uh, environmental and mu municipal codes are, are not violated. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shori David. Um, my daughter is a member of Pali High Go Girls Golf Team. <laughs> they frequently practice at Rancho Park Golf Course. Many kids from different parts of the city come and practice at, their own, at Rancho Park and eat at the restaurant. The idea of having a brewery at this location is not acceptable. This will change the clubhouse from a family place to a place that will, will be visited by many people such as alcoholic or can attract drunk crowd. I am strongly against this project and so are many other parents from Pali High that I talked to that they are on golf team. What I want to ask you is this, if you had a teenager and she was, or he was going to the golf course as a parent, would you vote for something like this? So your child goes there. My children went to camp there when they were kids. I've been in that neighborhood for over 20 years. 
I don't want something like that to be in that neighborhood. You know, just, yeah, I know you're here to vote at it, but put yourself in the position of a parent as a practical thing. If it was your child, when you're dropping off your children somewhere, okay. are you worried about them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I, I apologize why your names didn't come up. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak on this item? No. Thank you. Thank you. If I could have the department come back up. And again, I, for the record, um, I know Councilmember Koretz or Councilor District 5 is a, a, in another committee meeting, so he couldn't come personally himself. But there is a letter from his office who is in support of the department's recommendation to move this forward. So, but for the department, um, do you want to um, kick this discussion off and explain what we have before us and how we arrived to this revised agreement? Sure. Good afternoon, uh, committee members. Matthew Rudnick, Chief Management Analyst at the Department of Recreation and Parks. I'm actually joined by our Golf Division Manager, Laura Barnfind, and Jay Shin, our CAO Analyst. Um, so uh, just I'll give just some, some highlights. Obviously, it's been a long day in committee today. Um, so Rec and Parks oversees one of the largest municipal golf systems in the country. We, we run 12 golf courses in one junior academy. Most of our golf courses um, include cafes or restaurants that are operated by uh, concessionaires through agreements with the department. Um, last year, Rec and Parks released um, uh, a request for proposals for eight of our nine golf um, cafes and restaurants. Um, Rancho Golf Course was included in that bundle. Um, after an evaluation and a competitive selection process, which is more fully detailed in the report, the Rec and Parks Board of Commissioners selected the tavern at Rancho Park as the um, highest and most responsive and, and most qualified proposer. The board initially, our board initially approved an agreement with the tavern back in March. Um, it then was sent to the city council for your review and approval. Um, we actually at that point got some um, communication from the West Side Neighborhood Council um, and were asked by Council District 5 to meet with the neighborhood council to meet with community stakeholders about some of the concerns they had about the project and the new agreement. Um, after that, we had about, um, we've had about five or six different public meetings on this, on this topic. There have been um, a variety of concerns, and, and we work to address many of those concerns hand-in-hand -hand with the neighborhood council um, and the council member's office. Um, so what in front, what's in front of you today is a revised agreement, which um, includes revisions that work to address those concerns. Um, and so we can go over any of those uh, changes we did make, if that's helpful. Um, the long and short of it is, in front of you is a 10-year agreement with one five-year extension option. Um, the, the agreement includes um, roughly an estimated $4.3 million in capital investment. So these are the compromises that were made with the community? No, oh, no, okay. they're, they're not. And I, I, can, I can walk through those. Yeah, can, you do that, can you do that first? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the modifications to the agreements sure, that were made? Sure, the modifications. So the some of the concerns yeah. were related to potential noise, after-hours activity, parking and special events. So we clarified the hours of operation. The park hours by ordinance is, is that the, the park closes at 1030. So the restaurant facility currently will not run past 10 p.m. at night. So that was baked into the contract. We added requirements um, that the concessionaire immediately address any noise concerns, either during construction, because there is going to be some renovation work, or uh, during their normal operations. Um, we've added a provision to limit the number of special events at the venue. The, 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 um, the clubhouse currently does hold special events. They're, they're, as was mentioned, um, part of the renovation includes the establishment of a banquet area, both for um, golf events, golf tournaments, so the, the facility can host those kinds of activities, but other events. And so we added a, a provision to cap the number of um, private non-golf related special events in, in the facility. Um, we clarified that there would be no movie nights on the driving range. There was a proposal as a public benefit to host, host movie nights. There was concerns about that, so we just clarified that if the community doesn't want something like that, we wouldn't host those kinds of events. Um, we also included a provision to give Rec and Parks the right to limit any of the proposed outdoor seating. Um, currently, there is outdoor seating. Uh, we're proposing to add additional seating um, for, for golfers and restaurant patrons, but we have the ability to limit that seating. And then lastly, um, a, a part of the proposal um, that we received from uh, the, the winning concessionaire um, is to establish a small footprint microbrewery, roughly 300 square feet, that would essentially replace 
um, uses of kegs or, or trucking in mm -hmm. um, beer. And there's already a liquor license established for the restaurant. It's, um, it already exists. And so what we did, we, we wanted to just clarify in the agreement that um, any brew um, beer on site would only be for the exclusive sale and use on site. It would not uh, be sold elsewhere or trucks wouldn't come in and it's not a traditional large scale brewing, mm -hmm. brewing op um, kind of operation. Um, so those were the, the majority of the changes that are now baked into the agreement that's before you. Okay. And, 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 I, and I interrupted your presentation about the capital improvements, if you could talk about that. Sure. So um, if you've been to Rancho Clubhouse, obviously it's a, um, a pretty famous, well-played golf course on the west side off Pico Boulevard and CD5. Um, but the clubhouse itself <coughs> is in pretty desperate need of improvements. Um, so the upgrades that are being proposed are upgrading to the seating and bar area inside the restaurant in compliance with ADA standards, um, remodel and reconfiguration of the main lobby and restrooms, um, aesthetic upgrades throughout, um, the remodel of the bar and restaurant, including um, the removal of an interior dividing wall, um, installation of outdoor patio seating, and installation of a new grease interceptor, uh, the remodel of the halfway cafe, which is on the, the ninth hole, and um, the design and construction of this kind of um, special event banquet space within the existing footprint of the facility. I wanted to just note it's important um, that Rec and Park staff uh, consulted uh, with the Office of Historic Resources, which determined that while there's plenty of golf history at the existing um, uh, at the golf course, the existing structure itself is not designated as a historic structure and therefore does not qualify as a historic resource under CEQA. So we wanted to be mindful of the history, but it's not designated a historic resource. And did you say the monetary investment was $4.5 million earlier? In the, in the capital improvements, that's capital what's going to be required by the contract, yes. Okay. So just uh, um, for the record, just to go over the timeline, um, this was already approved back in January or March, you said? Mm -hmm. March. But, it, but Councilman Koretz, who represents the area, pulled it back, had the uh, Rec and Parks and, I guess, uh, the contractor meet with the community again, and there were several meetings. It Correct. seems like there were f at least four, and these compromises were, um, were made uh, in consultation with the council district's office. seems like the councilman did a lot of work with the community there. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions? I don't. Thank you. Just, just one. I, I was impressed, first of all, with the... Uh, with the uh, the prime and the uh, sub, I think it's an interesting team, and this is the kind of diversity we want to be encouraging, um, in uh, especially in concessions like this. Um, but talk a little bit about the capital investment. I mean, it looks like the six million bucks is a nice chunk. You say a million dollars during the first ten years, another four point two in capital improvements. How does that compare with the with the uh, with, with the other applicant, Rancho Golf Restaurants? It was Sure, that was one area during our evaluation process that indeed um, the Tavern at Rancho Park scored higher because their investment being proposed was significantly higher than the other proposer. Um, and we, we Significantly, too, what, more um, than half? I'm just kind of curious what the think, range was. Yeah, I think that um, the other bidder proposed roughly $2.5 million mm -hmm. um, in total, and um, th this bid was uh, 4.3 in investments. And, 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 and forgive me, that's off the top of my head. I can look and just yeah. specifically tell you. Well, I see they got more points for that capital investment. I'm just curious what the, yeah. what the number was. Um, but I'm prepared to... Yeah, it may have been closer to three, and I, I asked my staff to... Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, that's all the question I have, Mr. Chairman. I'm prepared to support this uh, Great. proposal as presented. Thank you. And if there's no further questions, I would like to move that we um, set aside the CEQA determination and environmental findings of the Board of Recreation and Parks Commissioners as stated in Report 19-135 and determine instead that the proposed project consists of a concessions agreement to use an existing park structure and associated capital improvements that will modify an existing structure involving a neg negligible expansion of use. Therefore, the committee recommends that the, that the council determine that the project is categorically exempt from the provisions of the California Environmental Quality Act, pursuant to Article 3, Section 1, Class 1-114 1, um, of the City CEQA Guidelines and Article 19, Section 15301 of California CEQA Guidelines, not subject to any of the exemptions, exceptions set forth at CEQA Guideline Section 
15300.2 and direct staff to file a notice of exemption concerning the project. Did I get that correct, Mr. City Attorney? Yes, sir. Oh, and also, uh, uh, one more. Um, authorize the President and Secretary of the Board of Recreation and Park Commissioners to execute the proposed revised agreement with the Tavern at Rancho Park LLC for the rede redevelopment, operation, and maintenance of the food and beverage concessions at Rancho Park Golf Course for a term of 10 years with a one five-year renewal option subject to review and approval by the City Attorney as to form. Can I get a second? Second. Second it. Thank you and so ordered. Thank you. So we'll move that along the city council. And I believe that's all the business before pardon, us. Pardon me, Mr. Oh, Chair. Okay. Uh, Richard Williams, City Clerk's Office. Just wanted to clarify for item number three regarding neighborhood council systems reforms that the committee is noting and filing yes. the city clerk and done reports and is moving forward with it with the request to the city attorney as discussed earlier. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And thank you. A meeting is adjourned. Two. Wow. Yeah. You don't